Okay. <coughs> Please uh, raise your hand, those who have used a mental test in the past. Many people usually. Only two, <laughs> three, that's all. Because mental test in some labs is the main statistical test for all sorts of things, especially the people working in the labs of genetics. Because the, their research director has learned to use Mantel test when he or she was a student back in the 1980s or something like that, uh, when uh, Robert Sokol made the Mantel test popular among geneticists. And so I'm surprised that so few of you have used it. Now, those who have used it, have you used it for, uh, as a form of spatial analysis? to test for variation in community composition or genetic data against space? No, you have not. Well, maybe I should not give that talk then. <laughs> because this talk aims at uh, showing, uh, oh, this is the PDF. This is not what I want. Of course, what did I do with the main talk? Sorry about that. I cannot do a proper uh, presentation with this. Uh, Mantel, P this is a PDF. Oh, yes. This is the short, supposedly the short version of it. <clears throat> now I can do the projection, but there is still a lot of material to be seen. So let's say that I'm talking to people who uh, uh, are not using the Mantel test, but you might use the Mantel test if you go back to your lab and you have the uh, uh, community composition or genetic data, and uh, you want to analyze spatial structure. And as I said, ma in many labs, they use Mantel test. So this talk is the result of a paper that we recently published with Daniel and Marie-José Fortin from University of Toronto. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> the purpose is to show that the Mantel test should not be used for spatial analysis in ecology and genetics. And it is, uh, <coughs> the title contains an interrogation mark. And actually, this is another formulation that was proposed by Pedro Perez Neto during a workshop on spatial analysis. And he became uh, fairly furious at some point. And he said, what can we do to stop them from using the Mantel test? So I used this as a subtitle of this talk. Uh, <coughs> to, uh, I will uh, briefly review the Mantel test. Well, Daniel has already presented it <laughs> yesterday. Then I will examine some of the statistical basics of the Mantel test. What's the null hypothesis of the Mantel test? And is this the, the null hypothesis that we want to test? Uh, we will look at different types of R square statistics and sums of squares, uh, comparing the Mantel test to multiple regression, for instance. And we will see that there are two types of sum of squares, uh, again, between Mantel test and simple regression. And I will offer a simple example. Then we will go a bit more deeply and look at some basic assumptions of the Mantel test and see if these assumptions are met by data uh, across space, uh, data coming from a geographic map. And then I will show you two series of simulation results. And I'll finish with a real case study in population genetics. Okay? And so you have already seen that in Daniel's talk, in the Mantel test, we have two distance matrices. And in the case that uh, concerns us here, one is computed from community composition data or genetic data. And the other one is a geographic distance <coughs> matrix. And so in many labs, people just use the Mantel test where we uh, string out the upper or do lower diagonal of the distance matrix into a long vector. Same thing for the other one. We compute a cross product or a correlation coefficient. It, the end result is the same. And so this is the Mantel statistic. 
and then we test it by permuting the rows or columns, the rows and columns of one of the two matrices, which is the same thing as permuting the rows of the raw data and recomputing the distance matrix. So we can do the same thing using what is called matrix permutation, that is permuting the order of the rows and columns simultaneously. And then you do that a large number of times to test your Mantel statistic. It is very simple and easy to do. You simply have to call the Mantel function. There are several in R. You give your two matrices, uh, set the number of permutation, and run it, and you obtain a p-value. So that, this is one aspect uh, that makes it uh, the simplicity of use that makes it so popular. But then in this talk, I will try to show that uh, it, is, uh, it does not give correct results if you do it, uh, to, if you apply it to spatial data. Uh, Daniel already mentioned yesterday that this test was developed by Nathan Mantel to uh, study uh, epidemics. And he was interested in studying the relationship between the geographic and temporal distances in the events that occurred during an epidemic. In fact, he was particularly interested in leukemia. And this is the reference. This is a very highly cited paper because many people use the Mantel test perhaps correctly in some cases, but mostly incorrectly, because the Mantel test was not designed to analyze community data against space. It was designed to analyze geographic and temporal distances in, an ep in epidemics. It is Robert Sokol who discovered the Mantel test and started applying it to genetic data in this context. And I understand why. It's because at that time, it was the uh, <coughs> the only possibility, the only way that we had found to include geographic relationships in a test of significance on data. It, the geographic relationships naturally came in the form of distances between points. So he said, since we have distances between the points, let's turn our <coughs> genetic, in this case, or community data, in my case, into a, a distance matrix and use a mental test. At least we can compare the community variation to the uh, geographic structure, except that nobody had done the investigation that we just published and that shows that it doesn't work. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's look at the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis of the Mantel test is not the same as that of the correlation between two variables. Indeed, the Mantel test is testing H0, which is the absence of relationship, between the dissimilarity values in the two distance matrices. That's all we have, it is the two distance matrices that you string out and you test that there is no relationship between the distances. Whereas if you have two vectors, two simple variables, and you test their correlation, H0 is the absence of correlation between the two variables. It can be done with two multivariate data table uh, Francois Gillette showed yesterday how you can do that with the RV coefficient to a data table. You compute an RV coefficient between the two. So uh, again, the null hypothesis in the case of the RV coefficient is the absence of a relationship between the two data tables. And I'm just saying that the null hypothesis is not the same, because here it concerns the similarities. But maybe it doesn't matter. So we will see. A, li a little bit further, but at least you can see that right from the base there is this difference that may be a small difference. Now, when we compute R square in uh, in, in uh, regular regression or in the Mantel test, in the Mantel test the, com the test computes an R between the two dissimilarity matrices. If you square it, it is an R square. <clears throat> so when we compute the R square of multiple regression, we have seen this equation a number of times when I've talked about regression and when I've talked about canonical analysis. It is the sum of square of the fitted values divided by the sum of square of the original data. That's the R square. And we know that it, I will focus on the denominator here. It is simply the sum of square of the, uh, of, of the centered data. Uh, uh, like this, sum over all, all the all the 
all the species and all the sites. And I have shown that it can also be computed using from a distance matrix derived from Y. And the, in this distance matrix, if you take all the distances in the lower triangular, <coughs> square them, and sum them, divide by n, you obtain the exact same thing. So it is true that we can obtain this value from the distance matrix. I have no, uh, no question about that. However, when we do a Mantel test, the <coughs> square of the Mantel correlation, which is also an R square between, if you regressed one of the uh, str stringed out distance matrices on the other, you would obtain an R square, which is the square of the Mantel correlation. Uh, it is also constructed like that, if you do this regression. But then here you have the sum of square of the distances, not the sum of square of the y's. Does that make a difference? Maybe it doesn't make a difference. Let us look at the equation more deeply. The sum of square of the distances, if you string out the distances, you take the mean of the distances and subtract the mean and square them. That's the sum of square of the distances. Now, you can rework this uh, equation in a simple way that we teach in basic biostats course. It becomes the sum of, of the square distances minus the sum of the distances squared divided by n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Okay? So this is exactly equal to that. This portion is that. No problem. It is not divided by n minus 1. But then you have this portion here that is not there. And that changes the value completely. So there is no way of working on this equation to produce that. There are two different statistical quantities. So the sum of the, the R square of regression is not the R square of the Mantel test. They are two different things, because here I worked with the denominator. And of course, if we work with the numerator, we would also obtain this sort of difference. There are two different quantities. Just a small example to materialize this. If I consider the numbers 1 to 10, okay? I take the numbers 1 to 10, and <coughs> I subtract the mean square the values, and uh, sum them, I will obtain 82.5. No problem. Now, if I take the numbers 1 to 10 and compute a distance matrix between them and take the values in the lower triangular or the upper triangular, either one, it's the same thing. And uh, so I have all these distances here. String them out in a long vector of distances. Subtract the mean, square them, I obtain 220. So you see the number is not the same. Not only the equation is different, but at the end it makes a big difference. So this is just to convince you that we are not computing the same quantity. The R square of the Mantel test is not the R square of multiple regression. Okay? Uh, here is another example that I made up for the occasion. This looks very much like data that we might want to analyze. Let's say that this is the abundance of a species, and these are three environmental variables. Uh, given this sort of data, you might uh, immediately you would run a multiple regression to see if these variables explain the variation there. <coughs> When I fabricated these data, I created three columns of uh, random normal deviates with the R norm function. And I added them and added another uh, <coughs> vector of random data to make noise in the data. And then I uh, moved everything so that it became positive to look like species abundances. So this by construction is related to these three variables. So it is not surprising that in the results that I will show here, there will be a relationship. I built it in. Uh, so because we want to see, yeah, 
because of the construction, y is related to these <coughs> uh, environmental variables. The data on the map might look like this. I took these values and represented them by bubbles. And I chose random coordinates to, to plot them on the map, okay. just, just to show that this is the sort of data that we are all handling. It is very much like that. So if we do the analysis, here are the analysis. If I use multiple regression with the LM function, I obtain an R square of 0.57. Of course, I built the relation in, so there is a relationship. Adjusted R square is pretty high, and I have a significant relationship, even though the number of observations is small. Now, if I run a Mantel test, that is, I compute a distance matrix from this, another distance matrix from these three variables, Euclidean using Euclidean distance. Uh, I run the Mantel test. I obtain this value for the Mantel R square statistic, the square of the Mantel R, very small. There is no adjusted R square in Mantel test. Mantel test is, receives a distance matrix. It doesn't know how many explanatory variables there, there were. So the, there is no adjusted R square. And here, this result would happen to be not significant. So given these two results and given the way the data were constructed, we know that this is the correct answer. That one is incorrect, or it may just be that the test lacks power. But uh, in any case, if we go back to what we saw in terms of the null hypotheses that we are entertaining, are we interested in analyzing the variation of the data, or are we interested in analyzing the variation of the distances? The, very, uh, the, the hypo null hypothesis about the variation of the distances is the hypothesis of the Mantel test. While the, <coughs> hypothesis, the null hypothesis of, about the variation of the raw data is the null hypothesis of the regression. I think what we want to analyze is the, ra the variation of the data, not the variation of the distances, which is a derived quantity, right? OK. Uh, yeah, so which R square corresponds to the, to the question stated here best? I think it is this R square here, not that one. When we are analyzing multivariate data, it's the same thing. If we have multivariate data about sites and species or gene frequency with environmental data and spatial data, uh, <coughs> what do we want to know? Do we want to explain the co community variation among the sites, or do we want to explain the distances of the community variation? I think our interest is to explain the community variation, how it varies among sites using these explanatory variables. So in this case, instead of multiple regression, it is the RDA or partial RDA that brings the correct answer to our question. Uh, here is a small example that I published in a paper uh, in 2005. <clears throat> this is the sort of data that we may very well have. There are four sites and five species. One species is common to all sites. And then at each site, we have one different species. There could be many different species. It's just the idea of having different things at the different sites with one species in common. OK. So if we look at the sum of square of these data, we could do it after Hellinger transformation, if you like. Anyway, we will obtain some value for the sum of square of the data meaning that there is some variation among the rows. Obviously, there is variation among the rows. Nobody would say that there is no variation, right? Uh, now, this is the Jacquard dis distance or dissimilarity, that is one minus Jacquard similarity. Between every pair of rows, the difference is the same, OK? Uh, <coughs> because uh, there is on, uh, always what? One species common, and then the difference is one extra species at site one and one extra species at site two for all combinations. So we obtain this sort of distance matrix where all the values are the same. If we, 
can compute the sum of square of the distances in the upper or lower triangle, it's zero. Does that reflect what we see here? So there is a, there is a problem with this approach. Of course, I could also compute the sum of square from this, this similarity matrix, in which case it would be the sum of these squared distances divided by 4. And I would obtain this value that differs from that one simply because here I use sum of square on the raw data and here the sum of squares from the Jacquard distance, but they are both different from 0. So there is a big problem there that we obtain definitely clearly the wrong answer from the sum of square of the distances, right? Now, I will look at the basic assumptions of the Mantel test in spatial analysis. Do these assumptions hold? The Mantel test will compare <coughs> two dissimilarity matrices, as Daniel has shown, as, as I have shown in, my, in one of my first slides. So we have the two <coughs> dissimilarity vectors coming from the two dissimilarity matrices, D1, D2. I'll remove these numbers that are not what we are looking at. So this is D1, D2. So we could use these two vectors to plot a graph with D1 against D2, okay? Or, uh, well, if this is the response data, we would plot, plot D1 there. And if this is geography, we would pl plot geographic distances there. The Mantel test is simply a linear correlation, or we could use a Spearman correlation, which is for monotonic relationships between the data. These two types of correlation will work best if the distribution of the distances is something like that, if it is fairly linear and if it is fairly homoscedastic. That, uh, <coughs> that is, if the residuals of, the, of a regression line here <coughs> uh, would have a normal uh, yeah, normal residuals at the end. Uh, but uh, so this is what we are hoping to have. Is this what we have with spatially distributed data? Well, I used a, <coughs> a simulation where, uh, because, uh, yeah, I will use simulation where I created spatially autocorrelated data. And the, ad the advantage of simulation is that we know exactly what we have put in. Well, when we receive a pile of data from the field, we don't know if the data are correlated or what. So here, I will use simulations with uh, spatial autocorrelation of increasing ranges. So that's the advantage of simulations. We know what we are doing. And we will see if these two assumptions linearity and homoscedasticity are verified in the type of data, in the simulated data that look like data that ecologists and geneticists are doing. These simulations, in this, these simulations actually, it uses a function <coughs> from, uh, designed by geostatisticians that are based on a variogram. A variogram is like a correlogram that the uh, uh, Daniel described yesterday with geographic distance here divided in distance classes and a function that is not Moran's I but that uh, is often called gamma. It is uh, the uh, semivariance of the data. And a variogram, typic, uh, variogram with a a uh, spherical model looks like this. This is the relationship between the semivariance that increases up to a value that we call the range. <clears throat> and uh, the maximum value uh, uh, obtained is called the sill in geostatistics. There is also an intercept that can be non, not zero. That is called the nugget effect. But I did not put any nugget effect in these simulations. It's useless. I will show you simulations of, yeah, we can use the variogram to analyze real data. But then in the function that I will use, we can <coughs> the, set the parameters of the variogram 
and the function will generate data that, rest, that obey this variogram. That is data such that if we analyze them, we would find this variogram. <clears throat> it is a tricky thing, but geostatisticians know how to do that. And these functions are now available in R. Here is a small example of using such a function on a map that has size 20 by 20, in which I have uh, 400 small cells, small points. And here I use a variogram with a range of 10. That is, autocorrelation in, in goes up to distance 10. After that, there is no spatial correlation anymore. This actually creates patches of high values to follow the uh, Swiss interpretation of the pale values, and uh, low values, patches of low values and patches of high values. Okay, or it could be the reverse. Uh, and we see that the patches are about the size of the range given there. The diameter of the patches is about 10 and here too. Okay. So in the next slides, I will vary that amount and see what happens there. But then this is the graph that we obtain when we draw one set of distances against the other. Here we have the geographic distances, uh, and it goes up to 25 because there are diagonals also. It, goes, it is larger. Uh, maximum geographic distance is more than 20. It is about 26 in this graph. And this is the difference in the values that were generated. There was only one variable, but you can still compute the difference between this and the neighboring cell in this class, in distance class one, or between this and that, that will give a bigger difference for some larger distance class like 10 here. Uh, with 400 cells, <coughs> uh, we uh, already have a lot of uh, comparisons because it is 400 times uh, 399 divided by 2. So uh, the 200 uh, times 400, uh, 6, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 8, 0, 0. So is that it? <coughs> 400 divided by 2 is 200 times 199. So let's say that it is for 200 by 200. It will be 40000, zero, 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 uh, which is 40,000 points in this graph. Okay? Uh, there are so many points that it is difficult to see the clearly the relationship. So I computed a smoother, which is the lowest function here, to show the central tendency. <coughs> but this is uh, rather difficult to see and very long to plot. Even in R, it has to plot 40,000 points. It is not very useful. So I uh, <coughs> reorganized the, distance, the distances produced into distance classes for which, <coughs> yeah, one distance class for each uh, integer, I think. And then for each distance class, I computed the mean in blue and the median here, the black square, and actually, the, uh, the mean is a good approximation of the central tendency, tendency, just a little bit too optimistic compared to the uh, median. Uh, so in the next slides, I will show you this and that. I will not show this. Uh, OK, and we see here already, <coughs> oh yes, this is for a small uh, map of 20 by 20. In the next slides, I will use maps of 56 by 56, because this is what I, I will need in the simulations that I will show later. But just to set the ideas, in the larger map of 56 by 56, I will tell you why I have these, uh, these funny values. Uh, here, if I have a range of 0, then my variogram is flat, and the data are simply random normal deviates. So there is no patch of uh, any size. Uh, uh, any point can be neighbor to a, a point with similar value or point with completely different value. There's no spatial structure. And in my uh, little graphs here, uh, the, the distances uh, uh, fall 
anywhere, and uh, the, the mean is flat. So we don't have a linear relationship, but that's fine. There's nothing to, to show. Next slide here, I have a range of 10 in this map. So my patches have a diameter of about 10. The pale patches or the uh, reddish patches, they have, we have small patches all over the place, but they are located at random. Yeah, this uh, function produces a, random, a map of random values that are autocorrelated. If you produce another one, you also have patches in, of the same size, but they will be somewhere else. They, they're completely random. So here we have increasing values at the beginning of the distance classes, but certainly it is not linear because it flattens here, and certainly it is not homoscedastic. The variance here is much different from the variance there. So we violate the two assumptions that would make perhaps the Mantel test usable. Uh, this is for a larger range of 30, larger patches of red, larger patches of uh, pale colors. And we see that it is not linear and it is not homoscedastic. <clears throat> I like very much this one. Uh, this is with a range of 60, larger patches of red and uh, pale yellow. And uh, this shape actually reminds me of uh, the, uh, the story of the little prince when uh, the little prince asked uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the pilot to draw to uh, to draw uh, a, uh, a sheep a sheep, and here the sheep has been eaten by the snake, so <laughs> it, it looks something like that. It, it has the shape maybe of a <clears throat> of a mammoth, and certainly the relationship is not linear, and it is not homoscedastic. If we go to larger values, where the range is larger than the, the largest distance that can be accommodated on this map, then it becomes more linear, but it is still not homoscedastic. And well, actually, I, I generated tons of those, and it is never linear, except when the range is larger than the size of the map, but it is certainly never homoscedastic. So I think that this is one of the main reasons why the Mantel test has low power, uh, low power of the Mantel test, as I will show in the simulations that will come. Okay. <clears throat> it is the violation of these two basic assumptions. So now I will show some results of simulations that we did for this uh, paper. Uh, they are univariate simulations, simulations of data with the variogram as we have done here, but I did all the intermediate values of a range. And I repeated that, uh, I think, a thousand times for each situation, generating new maps and recomputing the Mantel test, but also a multiple regression against MEM eigenfunctions, DBMEM eigenfunctions. So I had to wait that we had presented the BMEM eigenfunctions because before I could present this, these results. Uh, so sometimes I give this talk to people who don't know about uh, MEMs, and I only tell them a few words about them, and I say it can be presented in another seminar, but here you have had that. So we will simulate spatially correlated data uh, on this 56 by 56 grid. And I will sample 100 points on the grid, forming a regular 10 by 10 grid, but with spacing of 5. So in the x direction, I need to have 10 points with spacing of 5. That makes uh, 46, <coughs> the number of cells that you need to have 10 points with spacing of 5 in between. And around my the points that I will use, I simulated extra, uh, an extra band all around of five pixels wide. And this brings the size in this way and that way of the map to 56 for that reason, because I wanted to accommodate 100 sample points with spacing of five. 
And I generated uh, maps with variograms with the spatial autocorrelation, with range, if you like, of 0, 5, 10, and so on, up to 40 units. And uh, I did a 1,000 independent simulation for each value, each of these values. And I computed multiple regression and extracted R square, adjusted R square and p-value for each simulation for each of these values. And I computed the Mantel test of the distances computed from the response data, the simulated response data, against geographic distance and also against the square root of the geographic distance because sometimes people use the square root in order to linearize linearize, yes, linearize, the, the d by d graph a little bit. So here, I, in these two cases, I recuperated the mantel r, that r squared, and the p-value. There is no adjusted r squared there. And we will look at the rejection rate of the null hypothesis in each uh, case, in each simulation. That is, how many times did we reject the null hypothesis for these data uh, divided by the number of simulations, how many times, that gives me a rate of rejection. And if the test is honest, it should reject at 0.05 <clears throat> when the null hypothesis is true. But here, the null hypothesis is not true, of course, because I generate data that have a spatial structure. So I am expecting the rejection rate to be higher than 0.05 with the data that I will show you. And then we will look at the R square for each method and what does it tell us. <clears throat> this is the, the two graphs that summarize all these, these simulations that took several weeks uh, to plan, develop, uh, try, and correct, and finally get the, fi the final results. <coughs> Uh, here we have the re results for the regression against MEM, the results for the Mantel test against the square of the geographic distance, and the Mantel test against the geographic distance. These are the values of spatial autocorrelation that I injected in the data. But because my data points have a spacing of 5, then when there is no, uh, when the range is 0 or when the range is 5, uh, I do not expect to have any uh, <clears throat> effect of spatial correlation on neighboring points because they are too far away. They are distant by five. So when the range is five, this is the distance where no spatial autocorrelation exists in the data. And this is what I, I obtain indeed. So if we look at the result of the regression against MEM, here there is nothing that is we have exactly the, reje the rejection rate of the test because each test is done at the, against uh, a significance level of 0.05. So the rejection is equal to the rejection level of 0.05. Fine. And then as soon as we have more autocorrelation than that, the regression <coughs> jumps up to uh, power that is to a number of rejections that is almost in all cases. And here it is uh, in all cases, we reject the null hypothesis as we should. Now with the Mantel test against geographic distances, we have this. So we never have the correct results. Uh, although when the uh, spatial autocorrelation is very high, we approach the correct rejection rate. But it is always smaller than that of regression. And even with this correction of the geographic distances, we have the same story. Well, it is dramatic, you know, with the data that have, let's say, a spatial autocorrelation of 15 on this, on this map, which is pretty big spatial autocorrelation, massive spatial structure. We only find it in 40% of the cases with the Mantel test. Well, we should always find it. Now, if we look at the R square, uh, the R square is depicted here uh, in the green for regression. But of course, we know that R square is an overestimation of the relationship. So the correct statistic to use is the adjusted R square, which is here. Again, it is zero uh, up to this value of spatial autocorrelation. But as soon as spatial autocorrelation 
uh, has a range larger than the distance between the points, we have pretty good uh, R squares here. Now, for the Mantel test, it never moves much higher than zero. So the R square of the Mantel test cannot be interpreted as the amount of, uh, <coughs> uh, of uh, variation in the data explained by the spatial structure. It is nearly zero all the way. <clears throat> and this is summarized here. Oh, yes, we, in the paper, if you're interested, go and see the paper. We did other simulations with uh, other methods that are used in landscape ecology. <clears throat> and uh, this was a suggestion of Marie-Joseph Fortin, who is a landscape ecologist. And we used the Lani triangulation, truncated distance matrices, and this sort of thing. And the results were nearly identical to what I showed you. So you will find them in the paper. The result is that the power of the Mantel test was always lower than that of spatial analysis using Morin eigenvector map. And the simulation also showed that the Mantel R square was much smaller than the R square produced by MEM analysis and was not thus interpretable. This is a sad story, but uh, I mean, somebody has to ring the bell and say, hey, wake up, don't use the Mantel test for spatial analysis. Uh, how are we doing with time? <clears throat> yeah, maybe I can show you simulations that we published also the, uh, together in another paper in 2005, paper written with Daniel and with uh, uh, Pedro Perez Neto. At the time, he was in our lab. So again, we simulated, in that case, spatially autocorrelated data, but they were multivariate. The previous results, we had a single variable. Here, we, gen we had generated multivariate data that were like species abundances. <coughs> and again, we compared the results of RDA this time, because the data were multivariate, to the Mantel test. And uh, for canonical analysis, we used everything in the book. We <coughs> used the coordinates, XY coordinates of the sample points. We used the cubic polynomial that uh, Daniel described when he talked about polynomial regression and that we had used for variation partitioning in our 1992 paper. And then we used MEM spatial eigenfunctions, <coughs> formerly called PCNMs, because in the graphs that we'll, I will show you in 2005, we were still calling them PCNMs. For the Mantel test, we used geographic distance metric based on the coordinates, the distance based on the polynomial, the same polynomial as there, and then the log of the <coughs> geographic distance. This is another method often seen in the literature. This is the way the data were generated. Essentially, it was also on a grid <coughs> after generating specially autocorrelated data. So I skip the details. Uh, this is the model. And also, yes, I generated also environmental variables. <coughs> and uh, I generated 10 species. Five of the species could be uh, linked to the environmental variables. It could be a linear function of the environmental variables. And the last five species were never linked to the environmental variables. They were only spatially correlated. But then uh, in some simulations that I will show you, even the first five species were not linked to the environmental variables. So this is the main table of results that I wanted to show you. Uh, <clears throat> we will look at first at this one, where the species were not related to the environmental variables, the first five species. The last five were never related. But the species were autocorrelated. Okay. So you recognize this Venn diagram. This is the total variation of my 10 species against, uh, <coughs> tested against the environmental variables. Uh, let's see, where, I think the environmental variables, were they spatially correlated? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then this is what is explained by the spatial portion. The first three lines are the results of the RDA. The last three lines are the results of the Mantel test, where the calculations are done by 
partial regression on the distance matrices. OK. So we, many people have used this sort of partitioning on distance matrices, although it, we have never designed it like that. But there are functions uh, in the literature, and people have been doing that. Is that correct? We'll see here what happens. Uh, first, I'll look at the A plus B uh, portion. That is this portion here. We see that in these simulations, the species were not related to the environmental variable. So we should find a relationship only by chance. All the tests were done at the 5% significance level. And indeed, in all cases, we find about 5% rejection. Each of these results each of these values is the result of a 1,000 simulations. So this is fine. It means that both the RDA and the Mantel test have correct type 1 error. Well, we already knew that, but it is confirmed here. It means that we did not make any big mistakes in our simulations. <clears throat> now, uh, is, is that the second slide? This is going a bit too, too fast. <coughs> Uh, <coughs> well, oh yes, here uh, I, am li I have highlighted another column, which is the B plus C portion. The species were not re related to the environmental variables, but they were autocorrelated. So do we detect that? <coughs> so here in the RDA, against the X and Y coordinates, we detect a spatial, significant spatial structure in 20% of the cases. With our 1992 polynomial analysis, 40% of the cases, but with the MEM eigenfunction in nearly all cases. What about the Mantel test against the distance metrics of the XY in 11% of the cases, against the polynomial 7%, against the log of the geographic distance, 17% of the cases. So we know that there is autocorrelation in the data, and the Mantel test nearly never detects it. That's tragic. Uh, now, in the case where the species are related to the environmental variables, in, these odd, in this other set of simulations with the big regression coefficient, well, <coughs> the <coughs> here, variation partitioning using the environmental variables, always, nearly always detects, close to 100% of the cases, detects the, <coughs> the A plus B portion, that is, that there is a relationship with the environmental variable. The Mantel test detects it in about 28% of the cases. Again, we know there is such a relationship because we built it in. And Mantel test does not detect it. Uh, this, is, this can be tragic, as I'll, I will show in a uh, later example. But if uh, you have uh, analyzed your data collected with great pain and a lot of time using a Mantel test, it means that you are unlikely to detect the signal present in the data. So at the end of the day, you will have nothing to publish. Uh, okay, so this uh, summarizes what I just said. These new simulation results show that the power of the Mantel test is always much lower than that of canonical analysis. That the spatial variation is at best weakly captured by direct relation of a response distance matrix on geographic distance. None of the transformation of the distances that we tried increase the performance of the Mantel test. And on the RDA side, representation of the spatial relationship by MEMs is the best. It is much better than XY coordinates or the polynomial. That's what we are showing here. OK. Now, last part of my presentation about this uh, real case study in uh, population genetics. This story here, uh, this research, is about the Lyme disease. The Lyme disease, as you may know, is a <coughs> parasite uh, transmitted by uh, a mite that is carried by uh, mammals. 
and in particular in our region of the world, in the, in the northern, northeastern United States and southern Quebec, it is uh, the deer and the white-footed mouse that are the main vectors, that are the main animals that carry the mite, and the mite <coughs> may transmit the Lyme disease. And uh, when the, uh, <coughs> the mite is ready to, <coughs> is, uh, to, 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 to reproduce, then it leaves the, the, the host that carries it, somehow climbs in a tree, waits for another animal to pass by, and if it is a human, falls on you, you don't feel it, it sucks your blood, and it may inject you with the parasite, and you get Lyme disease. So it is a big uh, concern. Lyme disease was limited to northeast, eastern United States, but was not present in Quebec uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. But now with climate warming, the mice that carry it go further and further north, and the, uh, the acarians come with it and they, they survive uh, our winter now, and they, they, they are more of a threat. So there is a big money put into the research on the dispersal of the Lyme disease carried by the white-footed mouse. Here, uh, this research was done in the lab of Virginie Millien at McGill University, and uh, she, Virginie is doing a lot of research on that, and uh, this part of the research was done by a master's student, Anita Rogic, that was uh, working, who was working in his lab. And her task was to find whether or not the, natu the, the artificial, natural and artificial barriers in the landscape limited the dispersal of the white-footed mouse. So it is a study of the population genetics of the white-footed mouse that lives in different patches and moves around the territory, potentially carrying the Lyme disease. And here we will, her task was to study the effect of two natural barriers, that is two rivers, and two man-made barriers, that is two highways across the landscape. I'll show them to you in a map in a moment. Now, uh, important is the fact that Anita Rogic was a student of Virginie Millen with a co-direction by François-Joseph Lapointe, a colleague at my university, in my department, a good friend, and we visit each other all the time. That's an important aspect of the, uh, of the story that I'm going to tell you. So this is a map of the area. You have the United States about uh, somewhere here. Yeah, this is the, the head uh, of Lake Memphremagog, so this is probably the border of the U.S. here. And you have the island of Montreal, and here are the populations of mice that were studied, and you see these are separated from those by this large river, Richelieu River, that uh, comes from, uh, the, from the U.S. Uh, well, it connects with the... Uh, <coughs> with the, the, the main river that flows to New York. Uh, actually, uh, before we had uh, planes and highways, there were boats going, coming from New York to here, connecting to locks with this Richelieu River and bringing people in the Montreal area. Uh, so yes, this is a main river separating these populations, and this is a bit smaller river, the, uh, 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 which one is it again? separating these uh, other population. And then there are also highways, this highway and that highway that, are, uh, that separate, for instance, these two population from those or that population from those. So the, the idea was to <coughs> test the influence of these rivers and, uh, <coughs> and highways. Yes, special barriers, road can be represented. Oh, yes, I will come to that in a moment. Then uh, one day I walked into the lab of my friend François Joseph Lapointe, and there was Anita Rogic, the student that I had never met before. And uh, François Joseph was sitting in front of a computer screen with her, looking at the results that she had obtained using Mantel test. And uh, François Joseph called me and said, Come and see that. Uh, can you suggest a solution? 
Anita has been working in the field for one year, doing the genetic analysis in the lab, everything. Now she computed mantel test, and there is nothing significant. Oh, that's a problem because at McGill, like in our university, a student, even a master's student, has to publish a paper. And Anita had nothing to report in your paper because you will never manage to publish a paper saying I have no, no significant results. Eh, this is the, the p-value bias in the publication. Negative results are very difficult to publish. So she was stuck. Would she have to do another project altogether, spend another year in the lab and in the field in order to get her master's degree? So I look at that and said, how did you analyze your data? She showed me that she had no significant results. She said, I used mental test. I said, well, perhaps you can do something better. Let's try <coughs> by representing, uh, by using your raw genetic data, either in the form of raw allele frequencies or in the form of uh, uh, FST distances. And let's represent rows or rivers by each time by a binary variable. That is, <clears throat> for instance, for this river, you can code the sides that are on this side of that river as one, and those that are on the other side as zero, or the, the opposite, it doesn't matter, and do an ANOVA, okay, with the binary <clears throat> coding of the, of the barrier. So you simply do an ANOVA by RDA, as you have been shown in this course. And you can do the same thing for this river, and for that road, and for that road. Fine, she said, let's try that. But she, she told me, I don't know how to compute an RDA. Sit down, I'll show you. So half an hour later, she was acquainted with the RDA function, with the coding, and so on. And I said, now, OK, you do that, and call me when you have the results. The next day, she had the following results. Okay. Uh, so using FST, that, <coughs> the FST uh, genetic uh, distance, the FST uh, distance were decomposed into principal coordinates and put into uh, as, the, uh, as the response data in the RDA. We did not have at that time the function to test directly uh, the McArdle-Anderson method of testing as if we had done the decomposition. So here we did the decomposition and found that this river was uh, at a significant effect on the variation, genetic variation depicted by the FST. The other river, which is the Yamaska River, yes, also, Highway 117, 116, Highway 112, everything was significant. Uh, then uh, she also did it with the raw allele frequencies with the uh, uh, Ellinger transformation, of course. And again, all the results were significant, but here it was even more significant than with the FST. So now she had something to publish, and it led to the paper that you see here, in which I was kindly added as a co-author. I had contributed a little something, half an hour of work, showing her how to do an RDA. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, you see that this changed the, uh, the outcome of that research, and uh, it may, the message that is that it may also change the outcome of your research. It, that is, if you do the analysis of spatial data uh, in the right way by using DBMEM eigenfunctions instead of Mantel tests, you may obtain significant results if there is something, some signal in your data. While even though there is, there may be some signal in your data, Mantel test is unlikely to find it. Okay, so the conclusion of this last part of my last talk is that researchers like the Mantel test because it is simple to use. One simply has to type something like that. The uh, number of permutation is set by, de by default and you obtain a p-value. But you don't obtain anything else, actually. But uh, sometimes this is all people want. Uh, we have shown here that the mental test is not appropriate to test for the presence of spatial structure in raw survey data for different reasons. Uh, on the looking at the theory of the mental test, the null hypothesis of the test of correlation between vectors of raw data is different from that of the test involving dissimilarity. 
And this is the correct null hypothesis to be tested when you want to know about the variation in your original data. The statistics used in these two tests are different and cannot be reduced to one another. The uh, R-square of the Mantel test is not definitely not the same as the R-square of uh, regression or canonical analysis. Now, the Mantel correlation assumes that in the distance-distance plot, the relation among points is linear and the most <coughs> elastic. And that is definitely not the case for spatially structured data, except when the range of the overtone correlation is very large for, for linearity. Now, if one still applies the Mantel test, you could say, well, if I still do it, what do I obtain? Well, to spatially structured data, its power is always lower than that of RDA using MEM. It doesn't mean that it will fail in all cases. It only means, as we have shown by the simulation, that the power is very low. So we are very likely to miss it. But if the signal is very, very strong, mental tests will still be significant in those few cases. But for ordinary cases, you are more likely to miss to miss the signal, that is to have a non-significant result, than a significant one. Okay, that's what I repeat here. The R squared cannot be interpreted. So analysis by MEMs produces output that is more rich than simply a p-value. Because when you obtain your p-value, and Daniel has shown that when he the demonstrated analysis of variance by, uh, <coughs> by RDA, you can then plot your result in the form of one of these triplots produced by the RDA that will tell you the story, that will show the differences between the group with respect to the, the, the factors that you have put in the analysis. Uh, and then you can also produce maps of the fitted values at different spatial scales when you do the analysis by MEM. Uh, and the Mantel test is inappropriate to test the correlation between raw data vector of matrices, uh, irrespective of the fact that these are spatially structured or not. I've shown in the last set of simulations that the relationship of the species to the environmental variables was also weakly uh, detected by the Mantel test. This is what I'm, <coughs> I'm uh, reminding you here. It is not only for spatially structured data, it is also for relationships to environmental variables that it doesn't work. And we have another paper with Marie-Joseph Fortin in 2010 uh, emphasizing that point. So conclusion number four, uh, the main conclusion is that the Mantel test should only be used to answer questions that in the application field clearly and cons solely concern the relationship between distances. These uh, questions are rarely found in ecology and genetics, but we don't want to say that there are no such questions. We have actually one example from the literature where the Mantel test was appropriate with ecological data. That's all we have found up to now. But maybe some of you will find other questions, but beware. The, in the question that you want to answer uh, with distances should not be a question derived from a question that originally concerns the raw data. It's easy to say, oh, as I have heard the speakers say, if there is a relationship between the raw data, then it will be found in the distances. Simulations show that this is not the case. It may not be found in the... So it may still be useful if the question only concerns the distances. And uh, so finally, who wants to use a test that has low power? If you want to use a test that has low power, help yourself. <laughs> OK, the funny thing uh, when you assemble the bibliography on my various interventions on the Mantel test is that I started investigating properties of the partial Mantel test, you see, uh, here com uh, compared to partial correlation in 2000. Then we had this paper in 2005, the one with Paris Joseph Fortin in 2010. And in 2015, with Marie-Josée and Daniel. Uh, God knows what I'm going to publish on the Mantel test in 2020. <laughs> OK, thank you. you have, uh, if you have questions, I'll be able, uh, uh, happy to answer them. Thank you for the organizers of this uh, workshop, for all the work you have put into bringing all of us together. 
I have had a lot of fun uh, in <laughs> interacting with you during this week. And we are going to interact again this afternoon in the computer room. Now, time for lunch? Yes. Good.